Try to find an empty seat, but we're about ready to begin. Well, good morning and welcome to the 53rd year of the Landon Lecture Series. Former K-State President James McCain instituted the Landon Lecture Series in 1966 when former Kansas Governor Alf Landon, <clears throat> the namesake for our lecture series, delivered the series' first lecture, New Challenges in International Relations. Governor Landon was a champion for society by proposing programs that dealt with women's suffrage, antitrust legislation, prohibition of child labor, and many other important issues of the day. He was not only prepared, but inspired to address challenging issues, just as we continue to be today. That is why this lecture series exists, to bring prominent thought leaders to Kansas State University to discuss pressing issues and topics that stimulate thought and provoke discussion. Today, we are very pleased to welcome U.S. Senator Jerry Moran to the Landon program as the 178th Landon lecturer to share his thoughts and opinions on important topics impacting our region and the world. Before Senator Moran takes the podium, I would like to take just a minute to introduce a few individuals in attendance. And if you can, please stand. I know it's a little bit crowded, but if you can, please stand. Uh, Dr. Chuck Tabor, our provost and executive vice president. Ms. Linda Cook, Ms. Linda Cook, Chair of the Landon Lecture Series and Chief of Staff in the Office of the President. D Dr. Barry Flinchbaugh, Chair of the Landon Patrons. That was a pretty good applause for you, Barry. <laughs> Mrs. Becky Bonnablas, President of University Support Senate. Dr. Spencer Wood, President of the Faculty Senate. And Ms. Jordan Keel, our student body uh, president and senior in industrial engineering. And Lacey Pitts, our student body vice president and senior in agricultural economics. I'd also like to introduce our distinguished guest, uh, a special guest, the Honorable Nancy Kassenbaum Baker, former U.S. Senator of Kansas. Nancy. <laughs> Mr. Tracy Mann, K-State alumnus and Lieutenant Governor of Kansas. Dr. Blake Flanders, K-State alumnus and President and CEO of the Kansas Board of Regents. And Mr. Dennis Mullen, Chair of the Kansas Board of Regents. Anybody from my class, the LEAD 450 class? Where are you? Well, that ain't enough. <laughs> I told them they're gonna get a special treat if we get a quorum, I don't know. Maybe they didn't make it in, so, okay, well, that'll reflect. Um, <laughs> just joking. Um, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, you are critical, I think, to this conversation taking place today. After Senator Moran's remarks, we are gonna have about 15 minutes set aside for Q&A, and we'll announce that when he's finished. Uh, now for our speaker, Senator Jerry Moran grew up about two and a half hours west of Manhattan in Plainville, Kansas. He attended Fort Hayes State University and later the University of Kansas, where he completed a degree in economics. After an early career as a banker, he received his JD from the University of Kansas School of Law. Senator Moran has been serving Kansans in the United States Senate since 2011 and he previously served seven terms in the United States House of Representatives. He currently serves as a co-chair of the Congressional Task Force on Down Syndrome, the Senate Aerospace Caucus, the Senate NIH Caucus, and the Senate Defense Communities Caucus. In the Senate, he serves on the Senate Appropriations, Commerce, Veterans Affairs, Banking, and Indian Affairs Committees. He co-founded and is a member of the Senate Hunger Caucus, Senate Community Pharmacy Caucus, and the Senate 
Economic Mobility Caucus. Senator Moran has received many awards throughout his career, including the Science Coalition's Champion of Science Award and the National Rural Health Association's Legislative Award in 2014, the National Down Syndrome Society's Impact Award in 2017, and the inaugural Dennis Moore Alzheimer Champion Award from the Alzheimer's Association of Central and Western Kansas in 2018. When Senator Moran is not in Washington, D.C. representing Kansas, he serves on numerous civic organizations around the state. He serves on the University of Kansas Law School Board of Governors, the Board of Trustees uh, of Fort Hayes State University Endowment Foundation, a former trustee of the Eisenhower Foundation, and is an active member of the Lions Club, Rotary Club, and the Sons of the American Legion. <clears throat> he is a member of the U.S. Military Academy Board of Visitors and previously served on the U.S. Air Force Academy Board of Visitors. Senator Moran and his wife, Robin. and Robba is here, by the way, and uh, former Board of Regents. Would you stand up and just wave at everybody, Robba? And they now reside in uh, Manhattan, Kansas. And if you knew his workout routine, you'd know where to meet him to ask him questions when he's <laughs> trying to get some exercise. I know it, and some of you probably know it too. They have two daughters, Kelsey and Alex, both of whom are here. Would you, would you ladies wave to the crowd as well, or stand up and let them see you? <laughs> now both Kelsey and Alex hold degrees from Kansas State University. So, And Dr. Flinchbar, our patron's chair, has been quoted as saying, each generation gets more intelligent <laughs> and attends Kansas State University. That's what Burry says. We're happy to have all of you here, the family here. Thank you for being here. It couldn't be a more important time for Senator Moran to join us at Kansas State University. Today marks the 17th anniversary of the day terrorists launched attacks on U.S. soil since, uh, and the first time since Pearl Harbor. We should not forget how that day changed the world in many profound ways, from international relations and world trade to security and to defense. Senator Moran will share his perspective on these changes in today's Landon Lecture entitled, Answering the Call, Serving a Global Society Post-911. Please help me. Welcome to Kansas State University and to the Landon Lecture stage, U.S. Senator, Jerry Moran. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Just like a town hall meeting with only a few more people, right? Uh, good morning. Uh, it's such an honor for me to be with you here today, and I thank President Myers and Dr. Flinchbaugh for the introduction uh, and the invitation. And to Linda Cook, the Chief of Staff, who made all this come together today. And I heard these folks introduced by the President, but I want to issue my special welcome to our Lieutenant Governor Tracy Mann, who was our very first intern in our Congressional office in 1997. Uh, and to Senator Kassebaum, uh, thank you. Hello, Nancy. Uh, I was going to tell you uh, from this podium that I worked on your campaign in 1978, but I decided that everybody I ever knew told me they did once I won. Uh, but I'm telling you the truth. Uh, <laughs> Senator Kassebaum, I recognize as I travel Kansas that uh, the glory days in the United States Senate from the Kansas perspective is people long for the days of Bob Dole and Nancy Kassebaum representing them in the United States Senate, and we appreciate the way you did so. We appreciate the way you did so with such intelligence and such integrity. We gather here on this September 11th, the 17th anniversary of the attacks named for this day. We reflect on the events that transpired, the lives that were affected, and we recommit ourselves to never forget. It's not only a reminder of the attacks on our country, but also a reminder of how the country and each of us have changed since those events of September 11, 2001. 
I will never forget. Most Americans remember where they were and what they were doing when they watched the attacks on our nation unfold. On that day and in the months that followed, Americans bound themselves together. They lifted each other up. They prayed for healing. They prayed for recovery and the resolve to find a way forward. Through the enormity of our losses and through a recognition that the United States of America was under attack. We can't gather on this campus, focus on 9-11, and not recognize the contribution of now President, then General Richard Myers. He's a distinguished leader of our military, and with a career full of accomplishments, General Myers served as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during these turbulent and uncertain times. And he was the principal military and defense advisor to President George W. Bush, and he gave counsel on almost every major decision concerning our military and the defense of our nation now post 9-11. General Meyer's leadership to our nation and world and now to his alma mater is something we are all so very grateful for. Now, thank you, General. Now, I've attended a number of Landon lectures over the years. Um, I was trying to remember the ones that I thought were really good so that I could use that as a role model. I couldn't remember them. Uh, which is a problem, perhaps, for today. But this is a high-quality, respected lecture series named in honor of former Kansas Governor Alf Landon, who first delivered a Landon lecture, the very first one, uh, and he would have turned 131 years ago, two days ago, on Sunday. Displayed in my office in Washington, D.C., is a photograph of uh, President Ronald Reagan and Governor Alf Landon sitting side by side in rocking chairs on the governor's front porch in Topeka, Kansas. And President Reagan was there to celebrate with Governor Landon, Governor Landon's 100th birthday. I titled that photo in my mind, Two Old Codgers. <laughs> Five years prior to that, President Reagan delivered his own Landon lecture. President Reagan that day described Governor Landon like this. No one is more the living soul of Kansas, which to me means quiet strength and the simple decency of all America, than Alf Landon. From Governor Landon and President Reagan to other presidents, governors, Supreme Court justices, entrepreneurs, cabinet secretaries, and diplomats, this lecture series is one I'm not worthy to be part of, but so honored to do so. Other than being an American, there is little in my life that would suggest I would ever grow up to become a member of the United States Senate. My dad was a laborer in the oil fields of western Kansas. My mom was the clerk you paid your light bill to in our little town. And I'm a first generation college graduate. And I want to acknowledge the many people, my parents, my teachers, other supporters all along the way who saw something in this kid from Plainville, Kansas, and encouraged him to chase after his dreams. Because of them, I was able to answer a calling to work in our nation's capital on behalf of all of you. We work on behalf of all of you in pursuit of a better America. September 11, 2001, I was in Washington, and the day began just like any other Tuesday. I just finished my regular morning workout when, with my colleague from New York, then Representative Chuck Schumer, we first heard reports of a plane crashing into a high-rise building in New York City. Chuck and I stood there side by side in the gym. We turned on the television in time to witness the second plane crash into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. We quickly concluded this is no accident. Chuck's thoughts turned to his daughter who worked in Lower Manhattan in New York City near the Twin Towers and mine to our daughters, Kelsey and Alex, who were at school in our hometown of Hayes. This was prior to the social media and the breaking news alerts, so that at this point, all we were certain was that airplanes had crashed into the World Trade Center and that our nation was under attack. We didn't know if the attack was over, if there were other hijacked planes, and if so, where they might be heading. Schumer and I quickly parted ways, and we returned to our respective offices to try to learn, out, to learn more about what had happened and what might happen. 17 years later, and now in the Senate, Chuck Schumer and I still remember that moment, a moment in which we were not a Republican from Kansas and a Democrat from New York, but we were just two dads, 
in a moment where party lines and political posturing ceased. We were worried about our children and concerned for our nation. Minutes after I returned to my office, my staff and I felt a thud of the plane crashing into the Pentagon. You could feel it in our office. And out the window, you could see smoke rising from those miles away. We still didn't know what was happening, but we'd been told there was a credible threat of another hijacked plane, this one heading for the United States Capitol. Capitol Police dashed from door to door to evacuate the complex. And while I sent my staff home, our office telephones began to ring. In chaos and uncertainty, it's often difficult to know what to do or how to help. I, like Americans across the country, were watching these attacks unfold on live television, and we felt devastated, we felt saddened, and we felt angered. But what little could I do to help in that moment? I did what I thought I could do. I ignored that order to evacuate, I remained in my office, and I began answering those calls. In 2001, I was serving my third term in Congress as a representative from the big first district of Kansas. And while I appreciated the opportunity to represent Kansans in Congress, traveling back and forth from my home to Washington, D.C. each week and being away from my family, it was tough. I wanted to end that weekly commute to be in Kansas full time, and I publicly considered serving Kansans in a different capacity here at home. But on September 11th, America was under attack. This was the first day that most Americans contemplated terrorism in the homeland. We knew our world had dramatically changed. I knew that we'd soon be voting on whether or not to send troops in harm's way to fight an enemy we had yet to define or to clearly understand. When I voted to authorize the president to use all necessary force to combat a new enemy, a decision that could only be made by the Congress of the United States in Washington, D.C., I decided I no longer could pursue election to any other office. Instead of campaigning across the state for another position, I determined I should continue serving in our nation's capital and concluded my work there was not done. This day, 17 years ago, changed me, the way I viewed public service and advocated for Kansans and for our nation. It broadened my perspective and deepened my resolve. In a new way, I had a duty not only to preserve the Kansas way of life that I cared so much about. It really was the motivating factor that caused me to ask Kansans to allow me to represent them in the nation's capital. How do we keep rural America alive? I cared very much about that Kansas way of life, but now I knew I had a duty beyond that to preserve and protect the American way of life. A few days following the attacks, I gave remarks at a chamber monthly eggs and issues breakfast in Hayes, the venue where I had intended to announce those other plans. Instead, I visited with Kansans about the week's events and how we all wanted to do something to bring justice to those who'd attacked us, to defend our country, and to provide support for the victims. I announced to that audience that my time in Washington, D.C., up to Kansans, of course, but in my mind, couldn't come to an end. The course we were on was not an easy one. As I told them, them, that, them that day, this was not a task for the day, not for the week, not for the year. This was now a task for a generation. This was our time to answer the call to make a difference. There was more I could accomplish, at least in my mind, more I could accomplish in Congress on behalf of Kansans and Americans, and I wanted to do so. Kansans returned to work, and they profoundly demonstrated that they would not be held hostage by fear. And I, too, returned to work with a new fire, a new passion, a new sense of purpose, determined to tackle every problem I could, to seize every moment of every day to fight, not only for those who were sent in harm's way, but also for our farmers, our ranchers, our teachers, our veterans, our way of life. And to that end, I've had a tremendous opportunity. And I've had a tremendous responsibility to work on important issues as now both a member of the U.S. House of Representatives and the United States Senate in the most powerful country in the world. Today, I'm going to speak about how 9-11 changed me as a legislator and the issues I've been called on to help solve in order to make a difference in Kansas and our country. 
But I also want to discuss how we should never forget, how we came together as a country to help one another after that horrific day. Front and center, as I indicated, in my work is to protect the Kansas way of life in addressing the challenges of rural America, agriculture, farming, and ranching. Some of the hardest working people we know, they work on Kansas farms and ranches. And it's their passion and re resiliency that drive me to advocate for them in Washington, D.C., so that they may continue to plant, grow, harvest, and market wheat and sorghum, corn, and raise and sell cattle. Agriculture plays such an important role in the future of Kansas. Only when farmers and ranchers thrive can rural communities succeed. In Congress, we often refer to the majority and the minority, and we use those party labels to divide ourselves into Democrats and Republicans. As a Republican member, as a Republican, I'm a, I'm a member of the current majority in the United States Senate, but because I represent you, I represent Kansas, I represent agriculture here in the middle of the country, I'm a minority on many issues. Most of my colleagues in Washington have very little understanding of the challenge that farmers and ranchers face trying to earn that living. Back when I was a member of the House of Representatives during a Democrat majority, a Democrat congressman from New Haven, Connecticut, the home of Yale University in the suburbs of New York City that spill over into the state of Connecticut, she became the chairperson of the Agricultural Appropriations Subcommittee, a job I've now held in the United States Senate. Congresswoman Rosa DeLora approached me on the House floor. We'd never met before. And she said, Congressman Moran, I understand that you know and care about agriculture. Would you please come visit with me and tell me what I now need to know, what's important? A few days later in her office, I began discussing with her the importance of the farm bill, crop insurance, agricultural research, and just a few minutes into the conversation, Rosa is very animated, so she goes, oh, no, 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 Jerry, that's not what I want to know. Just tell me, what does a farmer do? My point in telling the story is not to embarrass her or to criticize. I'm pleased that she cared enough to ask the question. Rather, this story demonstrates the minority that I often find myself in. Incidentally, I invited Rosa DeLore to come to Kansas. She and I had different ideas about how to do it. My suggestion was, let's meet on a, high, uh, let's meet on a farmstead along Highway 27. Only a few of you will know where that is, but that's what runs from St. Francis to Elkhart. I thought that would be an eye-opening experience for Rosa. <laughs> she had a different idea. Her question was, well, could we just meet at an airport? <laughs> I was pleased she accepted the invitation. We began in Little River, population about 500. It's a town in Rice County where we had cheeseburgers and coconut cream pie at Cheryl's Cafe. And I was pleased to see she wasn't a vegetarian. <laughs> After our lunch, we toured the Hodson family farm south of town, and, I visited, and we visited with Kendall Hodson's neighboring farmers. I also took her to a small town hospital in Lyons. It was a critical access hospital, something she'd never seen. I wanted her to see what delivery of healthcare was like in places all across Kansas. Then the next day, we concluded her visit to the state of Kansas. We went to Hutchinson, where she had the opportunity to tour the Kansas State Fair with 4-H kids from across the state. And she learned about their projects, and she learned about their lives. These kids were the perfect ambassadors for rural America. Almost every day I visit with someone from the ag community. Many of them are in this room. It could be the Kansas Farm Bureau, the Kansas Livestock Association, the corn growers, Kansas wheat. There's a host of other trade and, and commodity groups that come knocking on my door that I see when I'm home in Kansas. But more importantly than talking among ourselves, we need to be telling the story, our story, to those who don't know what a farmer does. We need to find the Rosa Dolores who are in positions to make a difference, and we need to bring more folks under our agricultural tent so we can have a widespread shared understanding of the importance of this industry. 
And while the value of agriculture to our state's economy cannot be overstated, there's another reason I go to bat every day for farmers and ranchers. Farming is one of the few places left in our society where children still grow up side by side with moms and dads and their grandparents. And in that process of learning how to farm and being on the farm with your parents and grandparents, we pass on to the next generation our character and our values and get an understanding of the real meaning of life. This country was based upon that and it's disappearing. We need to do everything we can to protect that relationship, that being together with mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. The character and values that were evident, those characters and values that were taught to our kids were evident when fires tore through Clark County, Kansas and the surrounding areas just a year ago. I made it to Ashland on the Sunday following the fire, just a couple days later, and I went to the church, the United Methodist Church of Ashland, and I was there, attended those services with many who only the day before had lost their homes, their ranches, their cattle. Even with their homes and barns burnt to the ground, their grass and cattle gone, the theme of that community of believers clearly showed to me was this, it's okay. They're just things. Despite all those losses, they gathered to worship God and give Him thanks for what they saw as their many blessings. In the months that followed, I spoke to many of those ranchers regarding the difficulties they faced in trying to recover and rebuild. I introduced legislation to provide them with greater financial assistance. The legislation was crafted carefully based upon the feedback from those ranchers and others in neighboring counties, and it was designed to get resources to those folks who needed it the most the quickest. I'm pleased that earlier this year, Congress passed and the President signed pieces of that legislation into law, and it was what I saw and heard from the people of Ashland that motivated me, drove me to pursue help for their cause. Unfortunately, those funds are beginning to make their way to our farmers and ranchers for rebuilding efforts at a time they are now faced with yet another uphill battle outside of their control. The United States has engaged itself in a trade war that I'm not convinced anyone can win. Agriculture is a worthy calling. It's noble, and it's especially rewarding when the food that farmers and ranchers produce get to people who really need it. Farmers must have access to global markets, especially in Kansas. We're a state that has such a long-standing history of exporting, exporting commodities all over the world. In our state, trade matters. It's how we earn a living. Kansans are now feeling the effects of the recently imposed tariffs. Approximately $361 million of Kansas exports are being targeted in an ongoing trade war, including soybeans and grain sorghum exports to China, aerospace parts to Canada, uh, beef and corn exports to Mexico. With 95% of the consumers living outside our country's border, the ability for ag producers to directly earn a living is tied to their ability to sell food, fuel, and fiber as they produce for that for consumers around the globe. Last year, Veterans Day, I was invited to speak at Kensington, Kansas for their veteran ceremony. While I was there, I drove past this huge pile of grain piled on the ground waiting to be sold, and I pulled over and took a photo. I've kept that photo with me as a reminder of the reality of what farmers face. This summer, I handed that photograph to President Trump during a White House meeting to show how access to markets is needed to sell commodities and feed the world. I've also shared this photo with, in meetings with Secretary of Commerce, uh, Secretary Ross, the Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary Perdue, and more recently, the U.S. Trade Representative, Robert Lighthizer. Every time, of course, the reaction is, well, we need to fix this. Well, first and foremost, we need to have a solid path forward with an end in sight on these trade negotiations with China. We cannot escalate a fight between a significant purchaser of what we produce with no real end goal. Today, all we see is the United States imposes tariffs, China responds. The United States imposes more tariffs, China again responds. Tough enforcement of trade agreements and trade rules is important, especially when it comes to dealing with China but an everlasting trade war, tariff battle, 
is not. I also believe the responsible way forward is to work with our global partners rather than to isolate ourselves. We ought to be continuing to work to improve pre-existing trade deals, including the North America Free Trade Agreement, and we ought to be re-engaging in others, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Canada and Mexico were Kansas's number one and two export markets in 2017. Sometimes people just brush off the idea that Canada will not be included in an agreement. It's our number one purchaser of products and commodities from Kansas. We sell more aerospace parts and products to Canada than anywhere in the world, and more food and commodities to Mexico than anywhere in the world. Recently, Mexican officials told me, and I understand they're probably trying to bias my thought, but they told me that Mexico has already found suppliers for more than 80% of the commodities they typically buy from Americans. Plain and simple, Canada and Mexican markets are vital to our state, and both countries need to be a part of a final NAFTA agreement. Today's ongoing trade dispute doesn't just affect agriculture, but also manufacturing and other indi uh, industries important to our state. Recently, I was at Spiro Aerosystems in Wichita, an aircraft manufacturer and one of our state's largest employers. We were celebrating the 10,000th Wichita-built Boeing 737 fuselage. After 50 years of production of this aircraft, it marked a tremendous milestone for the company and the numerous small businesses in Kansas that comprise the local supply base. Spiro had also just announced an additional hiring of 1,000 more individuals to work in Kansas signaling its confidence in the future growth of aviation and the aerospace industry in our state. But now there's a 10% tariff on aluminum products, and the 737 fuselage is made entirely of aluminum. These tariffs may jeopardize what should have been a great success story for the Wichita economy, for the state of Kansas, and even for the president himself. It is one more example of the harm this trade war is causing, and we must not stop working until our trade policy is right for those who own a business, and those who earn wages in our state. So over 100 years ago that an aviation pioneer named Clyde Cessna wandered into Kansas, and he had a dream about building airplanes. And it's a testament to our strength, to the state's strength, and the talents of Kansans that a century later this industry remains so successful and that Wichita is known as the air capital of the world. We must be certain to continue we need to inspire, educate, and train the next generation of aerospace workers and continue to develop opportunities that allow them to work in Kansas to build the next generation aircraft. In Congress, I'm actively working to close the skill gaps that exist in engineering and other high-skilled aviation jobs, and I've introduced, co-sponsored, and fought for the advancement of legislation to incentivize young people, especially young women, to pursue technical careers and bring them to our state and help contribute and grow this vital industry. Kansas institutions of higher education play a major role. K-State is an active participant in achieving this goal. Three years ago, the Federal Aviation Administration selected a team of universities to serve as its center of excellence for research, education, and training in unmanned aircraft systems. These systems have the potential to unlock extraordinary economic benefits to our country. Everything from precision agriculture, emergency response, uses for law enforcement and our national defense. In K-State here in particular has a major, is making a major contribution to this center of excellence because the talents and expertise of staff and leaders like Dr. Verna Fitzsimmons and Dr. Kern Bar Kurt Barnhart and many others. Last year I got to enjoy my attempt to fly my first drone at K-State Polytechnic. It landed safely. <laughs> Another important development is the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility, where we welcomed Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue earlier this year in May, and just yesterday, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Secretary Nielsen. I'm proud to have worked alongside many people in this room and across the state who've worked so hard to bring InBath to Kansas and to Manhattan, Kansas. InBath will become a world-class, state-of-the-art research facility right here adjacent to our campus. Hundreds of PhDs and advanced degree researchers will find work here in what former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle called the Silicon Valley of biodefense. And it will help secure the world's food supply and fight against threats to agriculture and livestock around the globe. This laboratory is representing a changing tide in Kansas, and K-State should be proud of this facility and its successful work it took to get it here, and I'm excited to see opportunities that it will provide for students and aspiring scientists. 
One of my goals is to make sure Kansas, while never walking away from agriculture or aviation, to make sure those students who like science and mathematics, engineering and research, have a path for an education here, but equally or more importantly, have an opportunity for a job here. If we plan correctly, the amount of animal science and bio research that happens here in Manhattan will increase tenfold, and we will secure the presence of an entire industry for this region. If we come together and capture this opportunity, this community and this university will become the hub for groundbreaking agricultural research and the home to the scientists who perform it. I'm the chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee that oversees, for example, the National Science Foundation. And my subcommittee supports universities and their efforts to increase the number of minority students interested in STEM workforce. I'm excited to announce that we were able to secure a $3 million uh, grant just this week for the Lois Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation Program here at Kansas State. From drones. From drones to in-bath and everything in between, industry and research needs young people, and young people need opportunities. I hope to convey to the students in this room, to the next generation of engineers and mathematicians, of pilots and astronauts and scientists, Kansas needs you and wants you. Kansas will always be that ag state. It will always be that aviation state. But I'm driven to foster more opportunities in the fields of STEM. We want to build long-lasting careers here at home. For any of these good things to happen, our citizens must be civically engaged. Kansans will always be in need of public servants, and I'm proud of the many people I know who've chosen to serve the public good. I mentioned two of them earlier this morning. In Congress, I make a special effort to hire Kansans. I know that they work, the work that they do, and the work that they've done in my office since I was first elected to Congress has been performed with the knowledge that the policies we pursue and the work we do have direct and lasting impacts on their friends, their neighbors, their families, the people here at home. Many of those people who work for you in our office in Washington, D.C. and our offices here in Kansas are with us today. Some of them were even by my side when we felt the earth shake together on 9-11. To those who've been by my side advocating for Kansans throughout my time in public service, thank you. Not a thing, not one thing would have happened good without you. A few days. That must have been an applause line because my script says uh, long pause. Uh, so thank you. A few days after September the 11th, those attacks, I was part of the first congressional delegation to visit Ground Zero in New York City. I was walking through that area uh, of the Twin Towers where they once stood. And there, New Yorkers had created memorials to those who died at Ground Zero. Those memorials were created there in the dust and rubble, and they were places where loved ones could come and pay their respects. I passed framed photos of the fallen. Teddy bears and other stuffed animals laid there. Flowers, as you would expect, at that site. But a specific note, torn from a spiral notebook with that jagged edge, caught my eye. I picked it up and I read this. Dear Daddy, how much I miss you. How I hope heaven is a wonderful place. And I hope I live a life good enough to join you in heaven someday. Amanda, age 12. At that moment, reading that note, I again realized my commitment to the people who elected me, and my own call, my own sense of what my call was, involved a much larger, more complicated purpose. Public service now included the goals of making certain that there were no more Amandas, those who would lose their fathers at the hands of those who wanted to kill Americans and destroy our way of life. I realized that I must be more engaged in global affairs and I must think more broadly when legislating that my obligations reach beyond just the first district of Kansas. I realize that in order to be a good public servant and to fu fully, fully fulfill my constitutional responsibilities as a member of Congress, I needed to pay closer attention to America's position as leader of the free world. I realized I had a role, at least some role, 
in making the world a better and safer place. One of those ways, besides a, moral, besides a moral belief that we ought to do our part for those in need around the globe, I know that international assistance helps assure peace in our own country by promoting political, economic, and social stability in the world. We can act morally and achieve greater stability by way of healthy, affordable, and accessible food. Food shortages act as a catalyst for uphill and upheaval and conflict around the globe. And we've witnessed regions of the world as they descend into chaos due to lack of access to food, due to hunger. In assisting those who need it, we reduce the likelihood of another terrorist attack on our nation. It's a double benefit. We help people in need. We protect ourselves. Access to food provides hope, and it provides economic opportunity. And when parents can provide food for their children, they can provide a better future for their children. And if we can help equip people with the tools they need for a better life, maybe they won't look to Al-Qaeda or ISIS or other global terror organizations to find their purpose. The call to feed the hungry has been answered by so many Kansans before me, and I'm proud to support Dole McGovern Food for Education program, which provides meals for school children in food insecure places around the world. Dole McGovern, as well as Food for Peace, which was signed into law by another Kansan, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, is an example of the United States using its leadership role in the world for good and moral reasons. I called Senator Dole last uh, month. Uh, August was his 95th birthday. Um, I wished him a happy birthday and I had the opportunity to thank him once again for his efforts related to hunger, but also for helping to inspire me, to inspire my interest in this topic. And I now serve as the co-chair of the Senate Hunger Caucus. Senator Dole remains passionate as ever, and we, as we've often discussed, trying to continue the work he started to eliminate hunger worldwide. Sadly, the world is facing one of the greatest humanitarian crises of modern history. Estimates indicate that 800 million people worldwide, one in every nine, will go to bed each night chronically hungry. In Congress, we fight for international food aid programs and the agricultural research and development initiatives that reduce hunger and promote stability worldwide. I'm dedicated to carrying out the legacy of Senator Dole, the one that he built as a champion for those efforts to end global hunger. As Bob Dole would say, feeding those, as Bob Dole has said, feeding those in need represents the very heart and soul of our country. K-State is a leader in research to improve crop production and prevent post-harvest losses in key grain producing areas in the world, and it's critical to our effort in ending global hunger. K-State received over $100 million from USAID to establish Feed the Future Innovation Labs focused on agriculture production in developing countries. Additionally, we can't ignore those who are hungry here at home. Living in Kansas, as we do, we're the breadbasket of our nation and it can be difficult to comprehend that our neighbors often go to bed hungry. And it's true, especially in rural communities across our state. According to Feeding America in 2016, that was the first year on record that a great, greater percentage of people living in rural places were hungry, more hungry, than people living in urban areas, a startling trend that is expected to continue. The lack of a grocery store in many rural places across the country limits the access to healthy and nutritious foods and contributes to people's hunger. I'll always remember 2007. I visited Greensburg the morning after the deadly uh, E5 tornado. It tore that community apart, and it demolished the local grocery store. When I arrived in town that morning, it was unrecognizable. I happened to re represent Kiowa County, Greensburg as a state senator. I knew this community. You couldn't find a single landmark. Despite that devastation, I once again saw the compassionate nature of our state's residents. Neighbors, friends, and family, and Kansans who knew nobody in Greensburg, they all rallied to respond and to help. Many without homes were temporarily staying in Haviland, the next town to the east, kind of their rival, Greensburg's rival. But they took those people in. I drove over to Haviland. I remember the long line at the Haviland grocery store. It was one of those old grocery stores with the tin ceiling and the fan. I'm quite certain it wasn't making a profit or at least much of one. Behind the counter stood the cashier. Uh, I assume he was the owner, actually. 
and he took the time to make a conversation with every customer who presented groceries at the counter. And in a casual way, he just would ask, so where are you from? If the answer was Greensburg, his response was, no charge. It is a story worth knowing. Compassion defines our character as Kansans. But the story isn't just about Kansas kindness. It's also about the importance of grocery stores and highlights a larger challenge we face and the role that those grocery stores play in small communities and in the urban core of our state's cities. For as long as I've been in Congress, I've been telling people in Washington, D.C., now where I come from, economic development can be whether or not there's a grocery store in town. And almost no one that I speak to has any understanding of what I'm saying. In the case of Greensburg, the residents wanted to be certain. And they would call and they would ask. It was a common question that we encountered. They wanted to know, is the grocery store going to rebuild? And their view was, if the grocery store doesn't rebuild, we're probably moving away. But not surprisingly, a Hutchinson native and then Kroger CEO, David Dillon, who managed one of our country's largest chain stores of groceries, he took care of Kansans. He was lobbied to do so, incidentally, but he did it. <laughs> Dillon's was the store that was there before. It was gone, but he worked across the company to develop a new innovative convenience store that was right-sized for the grocery needs of Greensburg. And that store is part of the mainstay of the Greensburg community today. In this spirit, I introduced bipartisan legislation this Congress that would incentivize food providers to open grocery stores, food banks, and farmers markets in food deserts, areas where people lack access to healthy, affordable food. These efforts could help fill critical needs that affect small communities and urban centers across our state and country. Now, despite the amount of time I've spent working in Washington, D.C., truth is, small town Kansas really does feel like the center of the universe to me. I feel at home, more comfortable, and most centered when I'm in Kansas. Wherever your hometown is, I'm pretty certain I've been there. And I probably found myself thinking, I could live here. <laughs> 17 years ago today, the Twin Towers in rubble, the Pentagon smoldering, a plane crashed into the Pennsylvania field. Americans responded. Sons and daughters chose to serve. They volunteered to wear a battle uniform. They chose to answer a higher calling, and every one of those soldiers, sailors, Airmen, Marines valued American freedoms above their own lives. It was a time that called us to service, including military service. Many who volunteered, they did so knowing that they'd likely see combat. And many did deploy to Afghanistan and Iraq, to Syria and elsewhere. And some didn't return. Thank you to those here who served our country we honor the sacrifice that so many continue to make to protect our homeland and our way of life. Our neighbor, General Fort Riley, has been pivotal in our strategic defense efforts deploying 1st Infantry Division troops all over the world to protect our freedoms. And I'm proud to work alongside Fort Riley leaders to make certain that Fort Riley remains the best place to live, train, deploy from, and come home to. My leadership in the defense arena has taken me many places around the globe to see our defense efforts firsthand and to visit our deployed troops. In 2003, I made my first visit to our troops in Iraq and I evaluated the progress that was being made and the challenges that lied ahead. It was there on a trip from Baghdad to Mosul with General Petraeus by my side. I reconnected with a Black Hawk helicopter pilot, Army Lieutenant Krachina Gear Lewison. Lieutenant Lewison, a Hutchinson native and a Manhattan resident, 
had been injured in a grenade attack against her Humvee just a few weeks before. I knew this because she was emailing her mom and dad at home in Hutchinson, and they were re uh, sending those emails to a reporter at the Hutchinson News. So I'd been keeping up with Katrina, and I explained this to General Petraeus. When we landed in, in Mosul, an army aide tapped me on the shoulder. General Petraeus called his troops to attention, and I pinned a purple heart that day in Mosul, Iraq, on Lieutenant Lewison. Previously, I'd had the honor, and now as I think about pinning a purple heart on her, the responsibility of helping her secure her nomination to West Point. Another reminder of how challenging times are and the effects of decisions that we make. Last year, I headed to another war zone, Afghanistan. It was my fourth time to visit, where Secretary of the Army and I expressed gratitude to our service members and received countless briefings from our military leaders on our strategy and in the region. And again, what's going to happen next? Where are we? When will this come to an end? The consequences of 9-11 continue today in Afghanistan. A strong national defense is our federal government's primary constitutional responsibility. Our nation faces a vast landscape of threats. There's a resurgent Russia, a military buildup by China, an unpredictable North Korea, a nuclear Iran, a rise of ISIS, and cyber attacks coming from every corner of the world. It is vital that we maintain a strong and ready force to meet these global challenges. On Independence Day, just a month or so ago, while Americans were celebrating in the United States, Rob and I found ourselves in a much colder, more hostile environment just blocks from Red Square in Moscow, Russia. In Moscow, I delivered the message to Russian officials that interference in U.S. elections will not be tolerated and any thawing of relations between our two countries can only take place if this and other behaviors change. Never before had I spent the 4th of July, Independence Day, away from Kansas, away from parades and barbecues, family and friends. Wherever I went in Russia, I can assure you, my thought was, I could not live here. <laughs> the Soviet Union was the center, was the central nervous system of an ideology that sought to overthrow capitalism and to limit freedom the freedoms we enjoy as Americans. The threat of nuclear war was with me throughout my life, particularly as a grade school and elementary school student. But it was a threat that we all thought, and it was, very real. And here I was on the first United States congressional visit to Russia in over five years. In the ambassador's residence in Moscow, surrounded by US diplomats, our ambassador, his family, civil servants and embassy staff, Americans who happened to be in Russia on Independence Day, but most importantly, the Marine Corps, those who protected our embassy. Well, the Marine Corps band played our national anthem in the ambassador's residence in Moscow, Russia. I can't sing the national anthem without choking up anyway, but it was an inspiring moment for Rob and I. And I was inspired to think about the history that I've lived and that we continue to experience where our nation's sense of purpose and how over decades our determined moral, military, and diplomatic efforts have changed the world and brought freedom to millions. Russia is Russia. Russia is not the Soviet Union due to those efforts. Over the course of time, I both witnessed and participated in great cultural and political shifts in our nation including those that followed 9-11. As American filmmaker Ken Burns said, and the Army Chief of Staff General Milley often echoes, it is the greatest arrogance of the present to forget the intelligence of the past. When I'm in Washington and feeling concerned or a bit discouraged, I'll put my running shoes on and I'll walk <laughs> up the National Mall. I see the World War II Memorial now, I keep going and I go by the Vietnam Wall and on my way back I come by the Korean War Memorial. Those memorials remind me that no serviceman or woman served our country because they were Republicans or because they were Democrats. 
They served our nation because of a much more, much more important calling. They believed that their service would help protect their families at home, make their country more secure, and the world a more stable place. I think back to my time as a high school student in the 70s. I had friends who were called to serve in Vietnam. They just happened to be a year or two older than me. That was the difference, a year or two, when you were born. I was embarrassed by the treatment those returning soldiers faced when they came home. And I've remained determined to make certain no veteran is ever again treated in a disrespectful way. On one of those walks up the National Mall, I stopped at the Kansas column at the World War II Memorial, and I thought of my dad back home in Plainville. I stepped away from the, from the monument. I had my cell phone with me, and I called my dad back home in Plainville. Fortunately, I got his voicemail, <laughs> because what I said that day is difficult for sons or daughters to say to their parents. I said, Dad, I'm at the World War II Memorial. It was built in your honor. And I want you to know that I thank you for your service. I want you to know that I respect you. And Dad, I want you to know I love you. During that walk back from the World War II Memorial to my office, my cell phone rang. It was my dad. I, of course, answered it, and he said, Gerald? <laughs> Gerald, you left me a message, and I couldn't understand it. Could you repeat it? <laughs> I felt called throughout my public service to make certain our nation's heroes receive the care and benefits that they've earned, maybe because I never served. Far too often, our veterans have to fight tooth and nail to access their benefits, but it's critical that our nation uphold its vow to serve them as they served us. The world recently mourned the passing of my friend John McCain. He was an honorable man and exemplified what it is to be a great American. He used his bully pulpit for good and allowed the injustices that he'd seen in his life to guide his work. I've been honored in this past year and a half to work closely, work side by side with Senator McCain on veterans issues, particularly the issue of choice and veterans access to timely and quality health care, whether it be at the local VA or in a veterans community. Senator McCain fought to improve veterans access to care for years, and it's because of his steadfast determination to fix the VA that we now have a veterans choice program. And since 2014, that choice program has helped thousands of veterans access care, especially veterans, veterans in rural communities who may not have had a VA hospital close by. While some veterans have, have had success using the program, way too many times we've heard from veterans who were still being denied quality care in a timely, convenient manner. After hearing no from the department that was tasked in helping them, these veterans would return to my office and they'd ask for my assistance, our staff's assistance, in helping get through that VA red tape and get them the services that they needed. The legislative fixes and measures that Senator McCain and I developed stem from the experiences of veterans contacting my office and expressing their frustration with, how, with navigating the VA system particularly in situations where the choice program ought to have been available to them. While there's hundreds of cases we've worked on to resolve, I want to share the story of an Air Force veteran from Bonner Springs, a young man named Matt who received a 100% disability service-connected rating due to his exposure to toxic substances during his time in the Air Force. That exposure led him to leukemia and kidney failure. After the VA decided they would send him to Iowa for treatment, even though he lived just a few minutes from where the care could have been in a quality way provided, we stepped in and got Matt's request for care honored at the University of Kansas Center for Transplantation, where he could be closer to home and family and where he could receive the quality of care that he felt he needed. It was Matt's story that we used time and time again as a litmus test for substantial reforms to the VA. I'm proud to say we fought hard to make certain that veterans' legislation to reform the choice program and transform the VA's health care system now pass that test. Would it help Matt, and would it help others like him? The VA Mission Act, named in honor of Senator McCain, 
was signed into law this June and will improve and modernize veterans health care services. You know, my dad passed away a few years ago at age 98 at home in Plainville. So I no longer can repeat what I said to him those years ago. But I can say it to today's veterans. I can repeat it for them. Thank you for your service. I respect you and I love you. I intend to continue advancing the work for making certain veterans are treated with the dignity and respect that they've earned, and that they receive the benefits they were promised. Earlier, <laughs> earlier, I spoke about remaining in my office and answering those Kansas telephone calls on September the 11th. Now let me tell you what those Kansans called to say. They called to ask how they could support their fellow Americans, how they could help uh, with recovery. What could they do? On that day, the most frightening day of our nations that our nation has seen in a lifetime, Kansans chose to pick up the phone, call their congressman, and offer their assistance, their thoughts, and their prayers. I felt the care and compassion of Kansans in ways that I had not experienced before, and it too forever changed me. One of the most important calls I took that day was from my wife, Rava. Before widely used cell phones and texting and email messages, she had no way to reach me on that day, except by calling the office line, the main office line. And her concern for me on that day and her efforts to make sure it was she who told our daughters that their father was safe rather than learn something from the television, is representative of the larger sacrifice that my family has made in order for me to continue to answer the call of many. Through campaigns in my time in Washington, D.C., and all the other drama that comes with being a family and a wife of an elected official, my family, too, has answered the call. They've sacrificed much throughout the years that I could, so that I could continue to serve. Our family was all here this weekend. They sacrificed. They never saw their dad because he was too busy trying to figure out what to say today. <laughs> I know they worried every time I got an airplane to go back to Washington, D.C. in the months that followed the 9-11 attacks, might that plane be one that would be next to crash or that the Capitol might be the next target. Despite this, my family has supported me in our renewed commitment to serve Kansans in Congress. I'm grateful for their love and support built upon a belief that what we're doing is right, that service makes a difference, and that sacrifices are made as part of a larger contribution to our state and our country. Rob and I are both thankful that Kansans have granted us the opportunity to try to make a real difference. It is these Kansans I turn to when the challenges of Washington, D.C. are so great. Throughout my time in Congress, I've made it a duty to make sure citizens know that their voices are listened to before my votes are cast. 69 town hall meetings every year as a congressman, 105 uh, every two years as a senator. This was especially important to me during the health care debate, a topic that elicited strong and emotional response, pulled us apart as Republicans and Democrats. It was a mess along the political spectrum. For one afternoon, Palco, Kansas, a small town in northwest Kansas of about 300 people was the center for a national debate. I held my town hall meeting there for Rooks County, uh, which brought in lots of people who weren't from Palco or who weren't from Rooks County, <laughs> many of them here from in Manhattan, in fact. I held a town hall meeting which brought the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and even a Swedish television station <laughs> to witness this discussion. I happened to be the only Republican in the Senate who was having town hall meetings during the health care debate. Maybe others know something I didn't know. <laughs> Based on those discussions, it was clear that this bill was not good for Kansans, and therefore it wasn't good for me, and I returned to Washington, D.C. and announced my opposition. The initial health care replacement bill, called BCRA, was drafted behind closed doors and without committee hearings. Process matters. It's important. Too many times today we want to shortcut the system by which decisions are made so we can get the decision we want. But process matters. It's an important part of what we do as legislators. And process allows the voice of every American to be considered. And that's why it's so important to hear from Kansans 
before making a decision. I returned to Palco, incidentally, the following Friday. I was concerned that the locals would be annoyed at my bringing this mess to their town. Uh, it was a great experience. Not a person complained. The answer was, Jerry, it was great. The convenience store sold out of chicken fried steaks. <laughs> I think more than me, they are anxious to do that one again. <laughs> Healthcare wasn't the first difficult decision, and I suppose it won't be the last. We all should try to do what's right and not necessarily what is easy. I hope I de demonstrated my commitment to this principle in 1999 as a member of the House of Representatives during President Clinton's impeachment proceedings. I stood as a congressman on the House floor, never thinking that I'd be called, this kid from Plainville would be called to determine the fate of another elected official, in this case, the President of the United States. In a speech on the floor thereafter, I stated this, and I quote, I want my daughters to know I want my daughters to know their dad chose the side of holding elected officials to high ethical standards. I'm an advocate for truth and a supporter of the rule of law and someone who's not influenced only by party politics or the political passions of the moment, unquote. In 2018 now, we find ourselves in another challenging and uncertain time where Americans are once again divided and the president, once again, is under investigation. I stand on this stage, and I want my daughters to again know that their dad will adhere to those same principles now. Today, I've spoken about my experience on September 11th and how it changed and shaped me as a legislator. It altered my trajectory of my career, and it prompted me to recommit myself to serving Kansans in the nation's capital. But in addition to, and perhaps more importantly, than how that day impacted a congressman from Kansas, September 11th, 2001, refocused us as a nation on the things that pull us, pull us together, that bind us together, rather than those things that pull us apart. As I stood next to a New York City congressman from Brooklyn, we saw a nation under attack. While we disagree with each other more often than not, we stood there together and we saw each other as fathers, not foes. We saw each other as fellow Americans, not political enemies. That sentiment between us continues today. The first vote Congress took following the 9-11 attacks was a bill to authorize the president to send troops overseas. It passed the House of Representatives 420 to 1. That's a rare demonstration of congressional unity. It was important to show the world, then and today, that Americans were united in our resolve to take the necessary steps to see nothing like 9-11 would happen again. Just as we pulled together that day and in the days that followed, the memory of September 11, 2001 ought to have the very same impact today, September 11, 2018. It should be just as powerful. It ought to compel us to pull away from the division, the political posturing, and the partisan shouting, and just get back to work, solving the big and important issues facing our nation today. Back in the 60s, I remember asking my dad, this is when the Vietnam War was going on, race riots in communities, cities across the country. I saw this every day, every night on the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. I asked my dad, will our country, <laughs> let me say it this way, will our country survive? My dad's answer was yes, the country will be just fine. Every generation, well, even after 9-11, I suppose we asked that same question. Will our country survive? And I suppose every generation, it seems, has that question before them at one point or another. And today, I assume that many are asking, what's going to happen to our country? 
Will it be okay? Will it survive? The answer is yes. The country will be fine. But the country will be fine only if we stop asking, who can I fight, and instead ask, how can I help? This goes for all of us, not just me as an elected official or politician. I remain convinced that with this approach, how can we help? We can solve the most divisive issues of our time. It is our responsibility to do so. We owe it to our service members who served us at home and around the world. We owe it to those who lost their lives at the World Trade Center and at the Pentagon and on that heroic Flight 93. We owe it to future generations that will one day inherit our country as their own. May we never forget September 11, 2001. May we never forget the way we united in the aftermath of the attacks as one nation under God. And may we renew our commitment respecting one another to working together for the common good and answering the call to serve. If we do so, that means we never forgot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you sir. We'll stand there all right. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Moran, for coming to Kansas State University and clearly some very thoughtful remarks, uh, emotional as they should be on a day like today, and painting the vivid pictures you painted of um, not only 9-11, but what we can be. So with that, we have microphones down here. Uh, we have a few moments for uh, questions. If you'd like to ask a question, and I see some students going to class, I got that part. Um, <laughs> If you'd like to ask a question, please come to the microphone, uh, state your name, tell us whether you're a student, faculty, staff, or community member, and then ask Senator Moran your question. So the mics are now open for questions. In my town hall meetings, I generally try to leave about 60 seconds for questions. <laughs> uh, but I'm not uh, in control of the rules today. <laughs> Sir. Good morning, Senator Moran. Thank you for presenting Tim Weddle. Um, I was a student, and then I was a GTA teaching Spanish, and now I'm in the private sector and enjoyed all of those. So um, in, in the 2000 campaign, President Bush, um, or then Governor Bush, vowed to return decency to the Oval Office, and you ended your remarks today uh, kind of on that note of returning decency to the national political conversation. Um, I wonder if you could give first of all, your, your perspective on how you would encourage your colleagues to do that and how you would encourage those of us in the room and the audience to help. Uh, Tim, thank you for your question. It, it, is a, a, an, it was my attempt to make that point that that's so necessary. There's nothing wrong with disagreeing. Absolutely nothing. It should lend itself to a better answer, more knowledge and, and a conclusion that perhaps is widely accepted. I try to figure out from time to time, pretty consistently, why is this country so divided? And I mentioned process in my remarks. If people don't feel like they had a say in the process, then they're angry at the outcome. And so we need to do more as a Congress, we as elected officials, to connect with our constituents. And at the time, I mean, at this point in time, it's difficult. People are already angry. But the, the solution to that is not further pulling away from those we represent, but bringing ourselves closer to them. So I don't think that you can, I mean, we, we've had a number of instances, most recently the death of Senator McCain, in which once again we were pulled together, but they don't seem to be long lasting enough. And I almost sidetracked in my remarks today when I mentioned Walter Cronkite. As a kid, I watched the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite, and he ended his news every half hour, every, every evening, with saying, and that's just the way it is. 
When he retired, I discovered, at least in my view, he was a pretty liberal person. But I never knew it when I watched the CBS Evening News. And I missed the days, and it would be something that would pull us together if news was delivered in a way in which it just really is straightforward. And today, we all watch the media as what we want it to be, what we want the story to be, as compared to just the way it is. Social media, I've never had a bad ex experience with Kansans uh, in my time as an elected official, even in disagreement, sometimes uh, a strong disagreement. But social media has a habit, gives us a sense that we can say things that uh, we would never say in person. And again, it's pulling us apart. Now, I have a new, I don't believe it's actually Kansans who are saying those things on my Facebook page. <laughs> I have a new theory. It's the Russians. <laughs> but... Uh, your, your question is, is, what can you do? And my only point, I guess, is that all of us need to, to conduct ourselves in a way in which we respect other people. Mine is, mine is pretty straightforward. I'm of the view that God made me. I'm of the view that God made you. Who am I to be disrespectful to a, God, to a creature that God made? And with the right approach to people, I think we can pull ourselves back together, but the will has to be there. Hello, I'm Will Bannister from Manhattan High School. And the Will question, Bannister, do I know your family? Uh, you may know my father, Grant. I do. Okay. <laughs> the Bannisters are from Hayes, really. <laughs> so I have the following question for you. Africa is staged to be one of the fastest growing regions in the world. It has the world's youngest population. However, the United States has failed to open markets in Africa. It has become one of the largest consumption markets in the world and will continue to grow. Yet unemployment is rampant and Western education has become a cultural taboo, making it a bed for jihadist terrorism. China has take, overtaken the U.S. as the largest trade partner of the region. And investor, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative will only further this. Education is being continuously supported by China and offering a counter model that is destructive to our Western values. As Senator, how will you, what will you do to ensure that the United States can open African markets and ensure U.S. economic and cultural soft power across the region? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bannister. The, first of all, we need to speak loudly, and this is some, an, an area in which sometimes Kansans at least are skeptical um, and sometimes disagree. And that is that we have an opportunity, and again, I tried to outline this in my remarks, that it's to our own benefit to engage in Africa and elsewhere for our own security. Yes, there's a moral component. Yes, we uh, ought to be helpful in trying to feed the world. A reason that I chair the Senate Hunger Caucus is because I'm a Kansan who recognizes our production has a great calling, has a great opportunity for it to meet the needs of those uh, hungry around the world. And the work that goes on here at K-State helps people in those countries develop their own agriculture and food resources. So first of all, there is a growing sentiment in our nation that we should withdraw from the world. And my view is we can't afford either for ourselves or for moral reasons to do so. It doesn't mean that we ought not expect more help from other places. We ought not have to do this alone. It ought not just be U.S. tax dollars that are being spent. But we need to call the world to action. We need to work together in this global economy to make certain that we are fully engaged in the rest of the world. It is easy. I remember as a House member, a farmer in Kansas, I don't think he's in this room, but his instructions for me was, forget the rest of the world. Just take care of ourselves. Odd thing for a farmer to say. The question you could ask that farmer is, what 48% of acres do you not want to plant, grow, or harvest? Because we can produce more than we can consume. It is in our best interest to engage. And I would only highlight what you said about China. Nothing is in our best interest when China is more engaged than we are around the globe. And I'm of the view, particularly now when we are in the trade war and, and lack of trade agreements that I described, we ought to be fully engaged in pursuing every market. Africa, I've been a long proponent of trying to, to allow our Kansas farmers, American agriculture, to sell to Cuba. We don't do ourselves any good when we isolate ourselves. We actually harm ourselves. And so I just would say, I guess in broad terms, your comments are correct, and it's a broad call for the American people 
to support the efforts in Washington, D.C. to protect them and to provide stability, to protect the rest of the world and protect ourselves and provide some stability. Um, and in the meantime, in the same time, we can satisfy a moral calling to do so as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Senator Moran. My name is Lucas Scott. I'm a student of agronomy here at K-State. Hello, Lucas. And I wanted to thank you for coming out and talking to us. This is the kind of stuff that we don't always get, but when it's here, it's a true blessing. Um, I was curious, I was going to ask you, so kind of with the face of the trade war with China and the incoming population growth, there's going to be a lot of trouble in the agricultural sector of Kansas and America, I think. So in terms of research and also actually leaving a sustainable state and country for the future, what kind of things do you think students of agriculture should be doing to increase their understanding and also improve? I, I hope, I mean, my, my view is that all three uh, questions that have been asked give me a, an opportunity to highlight what I attempted to convey in my remarks. And I want this state, really this country, but this state to be a place where science and engineering is honored and esteemed and career paths are created for a student in agronomy to earn a living in our state. We, we can never walk away from agriculture. We should never walk away from our manufacturing and aviation. But in my view, our state is missing uh, another leg on the stool of our state's economy and that is the ability to keep young people who are interested in science and research in our state. That's science and research, a reason, I said earlier, a reason I've got involved in the, most people who get involved in the hunger caucus, um, many of them are, are not Republicans, uh, many of them are interested only in the programs that give something away, and I don't mean to diminish the value of that, but I wanted a voice in the hunger caucus speaking for the people who can create more because we can become more efficient, we can produce more, we can use science to our benefit. And while you express some concern about the future of agriculture in this difficult and changing world, the reality is we're going to be able to produce more so that more people don't go to bed hungry every night. And it is a result of what happens here at Kansas State, other land grant universities, other universities, in which we find and use science as a way of solving uh, those problems. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Senator Moran, this will be the last question. Oh, last question. Okay. Sure. That's Senator fine. Moran, um, my name is Amy Betts. I'm a faculty member in mechanical and nuclear engineering. Um, and I just wanted to ask you a little bit or expand a little bit on the role of immigration and how that affects Kansas, because this is also something that our policy changed a lot, or ideas changed as a result of 9-11, and then that's impacting our country today. Uh, Amy, that's a really valid point, and perhaps uh, is trying to summarize the policy issues that our country faces in part because of the consequences of 9-11. Uh, Immigration clearly could and should have been included in my remarks. Uh, we need uh, people who want to work in the United States. Uh, we need that particularly in Kansas and in agriculture. Uh, occasionally, perhaps more than occasionally, when I say this, I'm told by some of my constituents, if uh, Kansas businesses, if farmers and others would just pay uh, immigrants more money, I'm sorry, Americans more money, Americans would accept the jobs. I don't think it's true at all. We don't raise our kids to do the things that many come here in the United States to do. Uh, we need an immigration system that is much more, uh, we have an immigration system that is broken. We have an immigration system in which we can uh, determine, a per we have, a, we have a, a discussion in this country about what it is how many people can we assimilate into our country? What kind of people do we, do we want to encourage to come here? What do we need to do about a humanitarian role uh, in that conversation? And figure out how many people that we can uh, assimilate uh, into our nation and then have a system in, by which those, that person, those people who are trying to come here, their security can be identified, whether they're a security risk, their health risk can be identified, and in a matter of weeks or months, not years or decades, a decision is made. Our system today and our staff that uh, I, I, I would again praise, they probably spend more time on immigration issues than anything else, more so than the, for the business folks in the, in the room, more so than the IRS. We spend more time dealing with immigration, trying to solve people's problems. I sometimes think, incidentally, and I had this conversation last night, that we are uh, opposed to immigration until we know somebody who's immigrated. 
And so in the macro sense, we get nervous about people coming here, and we get to the micro sense, the individual, uh, and we want to make sure we do everything to help them. If they sit in the pew in church with you, if they work beside you at your office, uh, if they are providing the labor that you need for your farm, your view on immigration becomes something different than sometimes it's portrayed uh, in Kansas and across the country. So a, a significant effort at trying to uh, improve our system in which those things are determined. When our staff does casework trying to solve a problem, often the answer is there's a folder, a file, for that immigrant application. It's sitting on a desk in Lincoln, Nebraska, and it's been there for 10 years. It is a broken system that, that fails in so many ways. I had hoped, I, I'm for a DACA fix, I had hoped that DACA would be a method by which we could bring uh, people together and more broadly address immigration than just DACA. So far, we haven't been able to, uh, my, my, my thought must have been a faulty one, because so far, we haven't been able to even uh, address DACA. But for too long, in my view, we have said we need a comprehensive immigration system, uh, legislation, and if we can't get that, we're not doing anything. My take is, let's figure out what the issues are. STEM, th those with STEM education, I've introduced uh, legislation to allow more people in engineering to, to stay in the United States after their education. Uh, entrepreneurial visas, uh, work, uh, farm, farm and agricultural visas, both short-term and long-term. Uh, there ought to be, uh, there are, let me not say ought to be, that's a politician talking. There are enough immigration issues in which you could get 60 votes in the Senate, but too often we wait for the, unless we do everything, we're not going to do anything, and in my view, we've waited too long. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Senator Moran, and thanks to the folks that asked the questions. Thanks, all of you, for attending. Uh, this lecture, we uh, are honored to have Senator Moran on our stage here at Kansas State University. This counts as my Riley County Town Hall meeting for 2019. <laughs>